see the opportunities to really change the current paradigm? Mm. Well, I have heard from many, uh, I guess you would say scholars and thinkers and writers over the past couple of, um, couple of months. And, you know, for me, it was really important to listen to what the world was saying and to really connect with people from different levels of, uh, of reality, different realms, if you will, as well as different sectors of society. And by doing so, I really began to get a very diverse and um, uh, I would say multi-dimensional understanding of the times that we're in. And for me, I truly align most with the narrative around that these times are really either a portal for some, a portal which we walk through and we come out on the other side and we have a whole new world, a whole new reality, a whole new perspective of our own making, or it can become a hole where we get uh, sucked in and sucked up by the um, by the minutia and by the surface narrative as opposed to going deeper into the larger narrative the higher narrative uh what i love to call the uh the narrative of possibility and from the perspective of the narrative of possibility what i see is that we have collectively entered into a um a transformational portal whereby which we are being asked to explore and to reevaluate and to reinterrogate what really matters for ourselves as individuals for the collective and also for the future tra trajectory of our planet um, as it relates to what matters, right? Health, abundance, um, uh, connectivity, intimacy, um, how we care for our planet, all of that is now coming into uh, increasing levels of, of, of deeper and deepened awareness. And so I look at the, these times that we're in as a great invitation um, for us to individually and collectively explore that. And many of the people that I respect and admire um, are delving, including myself, are delving into this, um, this exploration of greater possibilities on our planet. Thank you for, for your perspective. And how would you make sure that we truly take advantage of this portal and we don't just close the door and stay in our old paradigm? Well, I think, you know, um, most recently I was reminded, I think it was a, of a, um, of a King Arthur narrative um, uh, where a woman, uh, I think it might have been one of those, like the late, not gonna say the Lady of the Lake, I'm not exactly sure on the particulars, but it was about King Arthur going upon his journey and he was asked the question, did you see all that you were meant to see or did you look away? And to me, I feel that that is also the invitation that every single one of us have during this time to not, um, to not uh, I guess, give this moment short shrift the opportunity for us to see from as many perspectives as possible. So the one way that we could actually do a disservice to these times is to only focus on our you know, narrow reality, right? What's happening for me here in Lisbon, Portugal? What's happening for the people I care about in New York? What's happening for my friends um, and my family back home in Nigeria? But if I don't expand my awareness to also include what's going on with the people in China, right? What's going on with those all around the world? And also what's going on with our environment and being able to see the bright spots, right? Being able to see, like we hear so many stories about, you know, um, the clouds and the sky being more clear, right? The quality of the air transforming, um, certain species coming back like the dolphins um, coming back to the coast of Italy. There's so many stories that are, are, um, are presenting themselves to us as an opportunity invitation for a different approach to reality in terms of lessening certain behaviors and increasing other levels of awareness and other levels of action. So to me, I think the biggest, biggest, biggest way and the most important way that we ensure um, that this isn't just kind of all for naught is if we truly engage the practice of not just you know seeing, but seeing deeply, right? Expanding our awareness and also expanding our field of action and collaboration. Because what we understand is that it's not just about our individual selves or our organizations, but it's truly about creating a lattice work of connection and also beginning to, um, to operate with uh, a degree of more synchronicity and collaboration as it relates to these shifts. So asking each other, what are you seeing? How is it impacting you? You know, how can we collaborate and work together in this area? You know, gatherings online are happening so often where you're hearing people talk about, you know, what they see for the future, what they hope for the future. But I have not yet seen um, an action plan, multiple action plans, as well as a collective action plan right now, because I think we have all, not we have all, but I think a great deal of the world has, has kind of become reduced to what's happening in my region, how many people have passed away, where are the recoveries, and a very, very, um, uh, I, would say, I wouldn't even say a low level narrative, but a local narrative. 
And that's very important. But at the same time, it's also important that we think about, okay, there will be a world after this moment. And what world are we actively um, and consciously seeking to begin to germinate, to begin to, to, um, to support and to uphold and begin to co-create? And so to me, that's really important that, it, um, that at some point, which I think is in the near future, and I, I do believe is probably happening at many levels right now, that we are starting to link up the different visions of possibility that we see to then stitch together a, a grander narrative, a larger narrative, whereby which we all can play a role and do our part. Thank you for, for this vision of collective narrative. And I know you are deeply engaged in creating, uh, in creating narrative and being a storyteller. And based on your life journey and based on your expertise, would you say that it's the right time to create a new narrative and to maybe try to make people follow it? And maybe that's also a role for transformative strategy. And I would be really curious to, to hear how you would approach that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've been um, getting interviewed and speaking a great deal about something that I call becoming a leader of possibility. And I truly believe that the possibility that we are co-creating is that of a larger narrative. And it has to be one in which each person can see the role that they play in it. You know, where the children can see the role they play in it, the adults can see the role they play in it. People from all over the world can begin to see themselves in this larger narrative. I think a great, a great deal of the time when these narratives of possibility are, are, are spoken into being, um, it usually leaves an, a, an aspect of society out, right? Maybe we're trying to move so fast towards modernization that we forget about the indigenous culture and the, and, the, um, and the elders and all that we've known and all that we're moving forward. So to me, I do believe that there is the opportunity to craft a grand narrative of possibility. I feel that the United Nations SDGs and some of the global grand challenges uh, attempt to get at that, right? But it, it has been translated at this moment into a task list of what we need to tick off, tick off, tick off, and a great deal of pressure as opposed to an inspiring narrative. And I think that that's the next step for organizations like the United Nations is to take these 17 SDGs and, and provide us a larger composite vision of possibility that we all can get excited about and that we all can feel that we are, um, are, are ready, willing, and able to contribute our part to it, as opposed to it coming from more of this like calamity and emergency and fear-based uh, struggle narrative, one that is truly inviting that says, look at who we are as a human, you know, uh, and, and, and I would say, because this is not just about humans, right? This is about every single entity, every single energy that exists on our planet. But if we can have a narrative that can unfold that whole you know, that higher dream of possibility, I truly believe that that is what's going to transform the world. Because we human beings, we are storied beings. We believe in the power of story. And when there is a story that we can follow, a story that we can access, a story that we can connect to, that we can orient ourselves to, the behaviors that follow become um, easier to engage in. So it's not just about you have to follow it, but I am inspired, right? I am galvanized, I am activated to participate. When you look at what happened even locally here in Portugal around these times, right, you saw that in a population where about 20 to 25 percent of the population is above the age of 65, there was this larger narrative that was presented to the people. Even um, campaigns about our role to play, which, you know, university that I'm affiliated with is using, and, um, you know, just this, this, these campaigns about what is the role that each of us have to play. And because of that, people were actually going into um, sheltering in place, solitude, you know, quarantine, even before they, you know, they were asked to. And so that was a story of a society, right, as a, a, a societal narrative of each of us playing our role and doing what is right in order to honor our elders, in order to not tax the, you know, the, the healthcare system. And every person who was participating in, in that knew what we were doing it for. I think right now we have a current narrative that it, it, in our world that is very uninspiring. And this is the narrative of money, 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 right? Make as much as you can, you know, get as much and eke as much as you can out of our system, you know, come out on top, uh, uh, do whatever it takes to, 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 you know, trample on others if you have to. And that narrative obviously is what's gotten us to the world where we are today, right? Who cares about the environment? Who cares about this? It's all about making sure me and mine is taken care of. Um, and I think that we are realizing that that narrative can no longer sustain us. 
and those of us who are at the forefront and who are actively committed to supporting the transformation of, uh, you know, of the current state of reality into one that is filled with greater possibilities are, are not only seeking out the narratives, but we are participating in each of our stories, right? So I'm a part of Otto Sharma's story, right? The Gaia journey, right? I'm participating with the work of Ken Wilber and what they're gathering. So I am taking it upon myself to link myself as a transformational change agent in support of these other narratives so that we then can cohere that, um, that we space, that, that interdependent and integrated field, right? Because it's only gonna be issued from the creation and the co-creation of a field. Right? The narrative is a story, but as the narrative begins to take root and begins to unfold, it does so within a field of reality, a realm, if you will. And so each of us are starting to feel into the greater possibility of what that is, the role we play in it, and it's also our responsibility to begin to connect to other narratives, because it's not going to be just one narrative. It's going to be each domain of society each aspect of our world, coming up with what is the highest narrative for the youth? What is the highest narrative for the way in which we right the wrongs of, 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 of past atrocities? What is the highest narrative? So what I see is a rising up of local and global narrative to then recreate and to co-create a whole new possibility, one, of one, one, one that we have yet to really even understand, you know? Because in our greatest dreams, when we talk about, yes, the world of peace where everyone is fed and da 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 that story for some reason isn't inspiring us anymore. It isn't in doing, it isn't doing what it was set out to do. And maybe it worked for a different type of world, uh, a simpler type of world. But right now, I do believe that we need more intricate, more um, uh, dynamic narratives so that everyone can start to really get engaged because it's really going to take reaching into the hearts, the minds, the spirits, the souls of every one of us to play the role, you know? And that to me is what's exciting also because what it's doing is that it's raising the capacities of humanity and putting us on what, you know, we talk about exponential technology, but I do believe that in order for us to live and to experience this new narrative, we're gonna have to get on that exponential curve. Right? So much of the projections we have about what we need to do as it relates to the environment and so on and so forth is on a linear lockstep paradigm and approach. But we have to get on an exponential curve. We have to really believe the same way that Corona came from this to that. We need to believe that we can make a choice that for a higher dream, a higher possibility, and immediately through our collective action, we are on an exponential transformative curve. And to me, that is, that is the great invitation, and that is the vision of possibility that I see, is humanity rising up, getting on an exponential curve as it relates to our capacities, our, our love, our willingness to be compassionate, and to be even more highly connected in a, in a very, very, very meaningful way. And that is connected at the level of purpose, connected at the level of possibility. That was a very inspiring explanation. Thank you very much. <laughs> And as I've understood your, your point, you are now saying that all these uh, alternative movements and alternative narrative could become the new mainstream if they become intricate, intricate and, and just converge together. That, that's what you're saying. Yes, because when you think about, you know, Peter Diamandis wrote and uh, Stephen Kotler wrote a book called The Future is Faster Than We Think. And for it speaks about the rapidly, not just accelerating exponential technologies, but about the convergence of them. And so I truly believe that right now in the same way technology is not just about artificial intelligence and robotics and so on and so forth, it's about the way in which these technologies are coming together. So if we look at what you know, Otto Sharma is doing and has done, what Alexander and Rama are doing, what I'm doing, what you, know, you guys are also in the process of doing, if we look at all of these methodologies and modalities, right, as social technologies, which they are, World Dream Day, the day that I found it is, a, is an invitation in the form of a social technology that enables people to work with it and to be able to transform and use it as a, as a, as a, a platform and a paradigm shifting um, uh, intervention, right? But if we look at these different disparate te social technologies, they have to come together. I would say even the SDGs is a form of its own social, you know, system hacking technology in, in, in many ways. So in the same way, artificial intelligence combines with robotics and creates a whole new possibility is the same way what you're doing, what I'm doing, what we're doing has to come together and start to create these, this new convergent transformative space. And that to me is a greater possibility because um, 
we're all working and believing in and hoping for and, and rallying around systems change. But each person thinks that it's going to be one system. And that is also the benefit of what, you know, uh, Ken Wilber has been doing over these years, right? Is this meta narrative, right? Um, of putting all of this stuff together. Uh, and so I think that that's, that is the only way is if we begin to interlink and we begin to align these different systems in a way that then converges and uh, creates a whole new level and a whole new wave of awareness and action. It was very, very inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, um, and I had this kind of more specific question because I saw you, your research revolves a lot around entrepreneurship and how that kind of acts as a catalyst for transformation. And also in your own life, you have had a lot of entrepreneurial kind of adventures and journeys. So I wanted to ask you, what kind of role do you think entrepreneurship plays in that picture, in that picture of getting on that exponential curve and on that picture of getting to that convergence of technologies? And how do you think that could unfold? Wow. Great question. Yes, because, you know, um, I believe in the power of entrepreneurship and I believe in it um, for many reasons. And one of them is that I believe that entrepreneurship is a rites of passage whereby which those who are starting the businesses of today and or modifying some of the businesses they may have had from a couple of years ago have the invitation to do things differently. And so these old big companies, you know, they're kind of set in their ways and just try to get them to really shift quickly in terms of their behavior, in terms of, you know, quadruple bottom line, you know, the power of purpose, all of these things. It's not as easy, right? Because the stakeholder mentality and that, that mindset. But as it relates to entrepreneurship and really thinking about how many entrepreneurs are all around the world, you know, you have a, an army for good, really. And so to me, I really do believe that the role that entrepreneurs play in transforming local environments at, you know, is, is, is key. Because if we can support their shift of awareness in terms of how they see themselves as leaders and the way in which they use their businesses to create a greater, a greater level and a deeper level of impact, that to me is, is the pathway. And so that's why I believe in the power of entrepreneurship. And I feel that entrepreneurs uh, specifically play a very, very powerful role. And so when you think about that specifically, right, when you start to think about startup technology, right, and, 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 and technology startups that, that previously have been all about, you know, I'm not saying that they've been all about getting people addicted, but the goal was to get people on that app, get people in that technology, get people in your ecosystem for as long as possible, right? So even looking at Facebook, right, it's about, dominating and controlling the screen time and your level of engagement where you get everything there you don't need to get you know to, to go off of it it's created a great deal of challenges right for mental health uh for even certain um, relational dynamics and so i do believe that the way the growth path for companies and what is is in what they are invited to become is transforming and will nece um, necessarily transform to support what this greater narrative can be. And I think that's the only way, right? Because the big companies are gonna to continue to, to be slow moving. Some of them are really stepping up and starting to do, do, do great jobs. Obviously we can always have more and we're always wanting more, but you think about like, you know, Microsoft and Satya Nadella saying um, carbon neutral, you know, bold statements like that are, are powerful. Now we have to see the behaviors also shift and modify to reflect some of those grandiose statements, right? Because that was uh, made earlier uh, this year in Davos. Now, entrepreneurs, when they come together and they begin to share best practices, those best practices are transforming entire trajectories it, from the local all the way, you know, up into a, a larger integrated um, framework for entrepreneurship. But to me, I just think that you, when you think about the participation of female entrepreneurs in that, you know, in the dynamic, especially when you come, when you look at countries like America, where a lot of women, especially women of color, are, uh, are, are, are the ones who are engaging in this. And so you start to see that there is an opportunity to begin to shift dynamics, awareness, behavior. And I think in, 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 in spaces where that is possible, those are the spaces, the places where we're going to see the transformation and then from there um, begin to see it uh, germinate and grow. And that to me is why entrepreneurship is, um, is important to this narrative because it is the, I would say the ground level work uh, and it's the way in which we can, aside from other systems like educational systems, it's a way in which we can transform society. Um, many years ago, when I began my journey of kind of engaging with the United Nations, I remember one of the most impactful um, uh, 
convenings I attended was one in which uh, civil society and the, the business community, right, was coming together. And it was very clear that entrepreneurship, the world of business, is, has a very, very, very powerful role to play in how we transform the world. And once I got it then, this was probably like around 2013, um, it really clicked for me. And ever since then, I've been committed to the role that entrepreneurs uh, can play in terms of transforming how the trajectory of our planet. Thank you once again for, for your vision. And now that we've touched upon entrepreneurship, we also know that you're also engaged in the educational or in academia. And that's also one part of the institutions that are addressed in the integral model. And what do you see entrepreneurship and education could do together? Because they tend to be some, somehow divided sometimes. And maybe there is a potential convergence as well to, to really reshape the institutions. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely believe that entrepreneurial skills should be taught at a younger age. Like to me, these entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurship in general is a, it's a foundational skill at this point. You know what I mean? The same way I think as you, yeah, it was Yuval Harari said that reinvention skills will be some of, will be the most important skills for young people, you know, by 20, I think 2050 was the number the year he was throwing out there. But you know, being able to reinvent ourselves, being able to pivot, being able to to think more um, more w w from a space of uh, of adaptive expertise as opposed to routine. Many of our educational structures and systems are all about routine expertise, right? Uh, memorize, get it done, know the answer, spit it out, and you're not really thinking about the higher order and the more complex, right, um, dynamics. And entrepreneurship teaches you how to kind of think on your feet, right? How to solve problems. And we know that we exist in a paradigm right now where there are so many problems and so many challenges, but if we reframe that, right, from problem to possibility, we realize that entrepreneurs become increasingly adept at being able to engage new possibilities, scanning for them, seeing them, engaging them, building systems in order to deliver value, to create and deliver value. And so to me, that value-based understanding is something that we definitely have to find a way to integrate and to connect more with the educational systems, right? Seeing that it's not just about what you retain and are able to spit out, but how do you, you know, and how do we create systems whereby which it is all about direct application, right? The information that is being learned in the schools are directly being fed to transform society. You know, I one, one um, example that I love so much is, again, it's not an educational example, but it is a community-oriented example, uh, was uh, Detroit Soup, right? Where people would be able to pitch ideas that could transform um, the community and people would uh, pay for, I think, $5 bowl of soup and that money would go towards, uh, towards an innov innovation in the community that would, like, whether it's like a park bench and suddenly you realize, wow, we came together, we learned about these new ideas, we voted on a solution, and now the solution is now rolled out in the community. I feel that education, and when we think about our educational systems, we need to have more of that kind of synergy and alignment, whereby which what young people or people of any age are learning is directly applicable to supporting the positive transformation of the planet. Because we really don't have um, the luxury of, of just taking in information that we can't use. You know what I mean? Like right now, we really do need to be gearing our entire educational um, systems towards usefulness. And that's, I think, is part of the reason why some you know, students today are asking for their money back as we transition online, because some of them are realizing that, wait a minute, some of these teachers need to step it up, right? Some of this educational system isn't actually serving me in the way and preparing me for the world that is emerging. And so entrepreneurship, the reason why it matters in a more entrepreneurial approach to education is that it is always seeking to be of service, to create value, to be directly valuable and applicable. And our educations and nimble and our education systems also need to be just um, as similarly nim nimble. Thank you very much. We can very much relate to that. <laughs> and now to, to address the notion of home, you, you've said that you come from Nigeria, but you have been um, growing up, I think, in, in the United States, and now you're in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. So I guess that your notion of home has been evolving a little bit, but how your home has been a launchpad or just a springboard to launch your initiatives, to scale your impact, and 
and just share your insights, basically. Well, I mean, yes, the, the notion of home, you know, in uh, my, the, the language of my original culture, which is I'm evil, um, my home is ulon, right? So that's the word for ulo is, is home and m my, so ulon. Now, to me, home is all about um, the heart space, you know? It's the place where you get to fully be yourself and it's a place where you get to truly show up um, for me as my best and brightest. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing now, obviously, because of the nature of isolation, has been doing my, my videos and, and a lot of my sharings and my teachings from my home. And so if you even see behind me, there's like a little bit of an altar with an image right there. And it has um, some images from Nigeria, but also uh, there's a, 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 I guess a patron saint called Senora de Boa Viaje. And she is like, the, the patron saint of good voyages, right? And so there's a town here in Portugal called Ericera that I have candles from that. And so I've really kind of seen my home as a fusion of all of the different journeys that I've walked. You know, being born in Nigeria, being raised in New York, um, going not just New York, New York City, but also upstate New York, the beautiful country, Hudson Valley, and then coming to Lisbon and learning more about this dynamic, the European culture, um, the diversity and the history of Lisbon. So to me, home, has consistently evolved to really live inside of me. And then what happens is I begin to create that and to have whatever is inside begin to emanate um, outside. And that to me is the way that it works. It's like we carry home within us. And then as we expand our awareness, as we ex expand our capacities, more and more becomes possible in terms of being brought into our vision of home. And so now I, I really do see myself as a global citizen. I see the world as my home. I see the universe as my home. I connect to the, you know, just my awareness of my, my role and myself in this home that is the multiverse, if you will, continues to expand. And as I shift my understanding of my local, you know, 2D, 3D, <laughs> you know, dynamics and connect that with a greater vision of, you know, a greater vision, not only of possibility, but the perspective of what does it mean to fully be at peace and to be aligned from within myself everywhere I go. And so to me, home is something that I carry within me and then I make, I place make, you know? And so I make these places that reflect that in different locations. And now to, to address our last theme of today, the notion of home for humanity, because we know for a fact that you've been there. And maybe you could share a little bit what Home for Humanity has inspired in you, or maybe how Home for Humanity has contributed to your world's vision. I would say, you know, it's been it's been wonderful um, to be a part of of, of the community and the um, the beauty that Home for Humanity has been cultivating for for quite some time, and. To me, when I think about even the charter, one of the words that, that really speaks to me is regenerative. And so for me, Home for Humanity represents that possibility of really being able to come into a coherent field of connection and to be continually regenerated, right? And to feel like you are giving and you are receiving, you are giving and you are receiving. And there is this, um, this enlivening and this beautiful dance between contribution and support and being supported. And to me, that's what we ideally want for our home and also for humanity, right? We want to live in a world that is filled with the energy of regenerative um, uh, connection and possibilities. And so that to me has been one of the greatest gifts that I've been able to experience at Home for Humanity and also been able to, um, to contribute to Home for Humanity, the spirit of that regenerative connection, the spirit of, um, of collaboration, and uh, just honoring the different uh, levels of truth and beauty that exist in every single one. Because, you know, you, we come as ourselves with our journey and whatever it is that we have to give. And we want to be in a place where we can feel um, accepted for who we are, where our legacy and our journey is honored. And so I see Home for Humanity as a, a convening space whereby which, you know, change makers, visionaries, creatives, you know, art, different forms of artistry is, is taking place and being supported and nourished in this regenerative, um, collaborative uh, flow. I'm sure Alexander and Rama 
will be delighted to to hear that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And maybe Mark, you have a last question as you always do. Yes, maybe to kind of come back and integrate all of that because these videos are kind of having the purpose of creating that living curriculum. So having the foundations of a living curriculum um, based on Home for Humanity. And you talked very interestingly before about the connections between technology, entrepreneurship and education. And one question maybe to finish it off um, that I had was if you could design kind of a higher learning education program based on this adaptive expertise that you already talked about before, um, going beyond the pillar of entrepreneurship that you talked about, um, on which pillars, main pillars would that education program be built um, according to your opinion or how should it be built? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways to go about it. I, I actually will refer back to uh, the methodology that we've been using with World Dream Day over the past couple of years. And it continues to evolve, but foundationally, it is what we call dreams to action. And so when I spoke about, you know, oftentimes when you're in the educational system, you're taking in all this information, but you're not actually able to execute, right, all the time. Or maybe years, or you may end up executing in another domain, which is completely fine. Um, but to make things a little bit more directly applicable, I do believe that we almost need to run our educational systems like sprints, like technological sprints in some cases, right? I think that there should be a sprint component, right? Of really being able to take a discrete amount of time and really go deep on applying or contributing what you've learned in service of humanity, in service of a higher, a higher goal, a higher dream, a higher vision. So in the World Dream Day, we talk about the four stages of dreaming and doing. The first is to get clear on what your dream is, right? What is that dream? Some would say, what is that mission, that vision, or the purpose? You know, in the world of um, exponential organizations and exponential um, transformation, there's something called a massive transformative purpose, right? That purpose that really guides all of your actions. We would call that the dream. And it's important for us to really make sure that our learners are clear on what is that higher dream of what they envision, right? And supporting the visioning capacity. I think educational systems have to support the capacity for learners to dream, the dream of new possibilities, right? And then from there, the second piece is communication, what we call declare. Our learners need to be able to communicate and declare, invite and enroll and share their visions with others in a way that they don't feel like they, they, they're scared, right? That they, that they cannot trust, because that also will transform the way in which all everyone begins to operate with each other if we believe and we begin to engage in rituals of being able to declare what it is we're up to and um and have that safe space so first supporting our educational systems supporting the capacity of learners to dream big second the capacity of learners to be able to declare their visions right and speak about it and share it with others third is about design that is a strategic capacity Right, being able to identify what are the different scenarios, what are the pathways in which this wisdom or what I'm learning can be, can be um, up, up, applied, and creating an actual strategy for how we're actually going to use that information that we've just learned or use the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve and contribute, contribute to it. And the last piece is take action and do. And I think that's where we see the gap, right? Because we can have the vision, but we don't always take action with it. We don't actually implement it. We don't find ways to take what we're learning and actually make a difference in our local environment. Even if it's just at the early stages, right? And maybe it's just not, nothing more than taking the wisdom and making it openly available to, to the community or to a community in need or some, finding some way to connect what's happening in the classroom and what's also happening in the world. And so to me, some component of the dream, declare, design, do, the importance of vision, the importance of, of, of communication, the importance of strategy and, and choices and design, and then you know, the importance of, of taking action and implementation. So we, we really do try, especially with World Dream Day, to, you know, we have a, uh, a dream curriculum and a lesson plan that we put out every year for, you know, for, for um, for educational systems as well as just anyone who's trying to move forward with an idea or goal or a dream and i think that our educational institutions connected to the spirit of entrepreneurship should facilitate the um 
the growth of, of dreamers becoming doers, what we call dream runners, right? Someone who has taken a vision out of their mind is moving it forward. And if you see the image of our dream runner, there's all these sparks that are coming off of the dream runner. And that symbolizes the contribution that's being made. Sparks of possibility. Because when other people see you in action, right, as a learner, as a dreamer, as a doer, they themselves become um, an act, you know, an activated and new possibilities are created on our planet. So I really feel that there needs to be the support of that, that you know, the elevation of that, of that loop of moving from having visions, really being able to declare and share them, inviting others, making them uh, collective visions, and then being able to design systems and strategies and then implement them for the service of, um, of a greater possibility on our planet. Thank you so much, so inspiring. And I think just I'm speaking for both of us maybe now, but thank you for sharing all of that. It was extremely inspiring for us. I think you, you spoke always, almost in the same language as we kind of have our values and that we base our principles on. So I think that's why we kind of really could resonate a lot with what you were saying. And uh, I will definitely rewatch the, the recording to get even more value out of it. So from my side, thank you so much for, for inspiring us right now and for also inspiring all the people that will watch this video. Thank you. And it's been, um, it's always been a great uh, experience to connect with the field and with the, the realm that Home for Humanity is cultivating. And it's a, it's an honor. It's a privilege. It's, it's, um, it's a great gift to participate in this project and the continued experience that is what each of us are doing to help elevate um, our planet. And again, always invited to World Dream Day, which is September 25th. And it's important for us to continue to identify the ways in which all of the work that we are doing in the world can support this higher trajectory. Because I think especially for your generation, the generations that are coming after you and um, those who have come before, we're at a very, very, very critical point right now. Some would call it the choice point. And this is the opportunity for us to really see, know, and feel that the actions that we are taking really do make a difference and that we cannot act alone, but that we also need to act in collaboration. And so efforts like this are part of that paradigm of how we begin to sync up our vision, sync up our different social technologies, sync up some of our actual, right, tech, real, not to say real, but I would say sync up the social technologies and the social systems with what's happening in the world of technology as it relates to digital technologies and so on and so forth. And how can we really get all of us on this positive exponential wave, whereby which all of us are able to make uh, lasting positive contributions to our planet.